Good morning. And welcome to Riviera United Methodist Church, to those joining us in person and to those joining us online. Please join me in the call to worship. This day is holy to our God. Do not mourn or weep. The Spirit of the Holy One is upon us to bring good news to the poor. This day is holy to our God, for the joy of the Holy One is our strength. God sends us to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and justice to the oppressed. On this day, may the scripture be fulfilled in our hearing. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasant to you, Holy One, our Rock and Redeemer. Amen. Our opening hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. If you're here with us in the sanctuary, it's number 64 in the hymnal. If you're home, it's on the screen. And um, I encourage you, wherever you are, to join with us in raising your voices in praise. <laughs> Welcome to our worship service. I know many of you are joining us from home due to Omicron, but we welcome you in worship. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with Let you. us share the peace with one another by reading. everyone. Good morning. I did it. Wow, we made it. Um, just wanted to welcome everybody again. I'm Kelsey. It's nice to see you all, um, all here and also online. Hello. Um, I wanted to make the announcement that we are still collecting videos for the Church Charge Conference, and more details about that would be 
in your bulletin. Aside from that, I wanted to do our moment of wonder that Dina usually does with us. Today, we are going to be hearing about 1 Corinthians, um, verses 12 to 31. And from that, we hear about Apostle Paul, and he compares us all to parts of the body. I'm sure we've heard this verse before. It's a pretty famous verse. But just to break it down for all of us today, um, I want us to just think about parts of our body. So let's close our eyes. Please participate. <laughs> close your eyes. Now, if I was going to ask you to read a verse, let's say I put a book in front of you, your eyes are closed, thumbs up or thumbs down, do you think you could read it? Probably not, right? There's a right answer here, probably not. Um, you probably cannot read it, why? Because we use our eyes to see. Now, if you were sitting down and I asked you to just raise your feet in the air, you don't have to do that, but if you were raising your feet in the air and then I asked you to walk 10 paces forward without using your feet. Do we think we could do that, yes or no? Probably not, right? So we are kind of thinking about us as parts of the body, as special and unique. We have been created to be part of this bigger body, this church of Christ, this body of Christ, but we're all unique in our own way and the gifts that we have and what we do for the body. So I want us to think about how the different gifts that we have makes us important, but also being a part of the body makes us important. Just think about if your body was only one giant nose. It's kind of silly, right? Just to be one big nose. Yes, you could smell, that would be great, but you couldn't see and you couldn't walk and you couldn't talk. All you would be able to do is smell. Or if you were one giant eye, you couldn't smell, you couldn't taste. All you could do was see. So I actually wanted to share with you just the message version of part of this verse. And I just thought the wording was really beautiful. I want you to think about how all this makes you more significant, not less. A body isn't just a single part blown up into something huge. It's all the different but similar parts arranged and functioning together. If the foot said, I'm not elegant like the hand embellished with rings, I guess I don't belong to this body, would it make it so? If ear said, I'm not beautiful like I, transparent and expressive, I don't deserve a place on the head, would you want to remove it from the body? If the body was all eye, how could it hear? If all ear, how could it smell? As it is, we see that God has carefully placed each part of the body right where he wanted it. For no matter how significant you are, it is only because of what you are a part of. An enormous eye or a gigantic hand would not be a body. I love that end part. So I want us to think about the gifts that we bring to this body of Christ, this church, and how sometimes it's easy to envy someone else's gift whether it's speaking in front of a crowd, whether it's preaching to all of you, whether it's being super welcoming, just a lovely smile, any, any of these gifts, wonderful in you know, cooking and bringing wonderful food to the potluck, everyone has a certain gift, maybe more, probably more, that they bring to this congregation. Thank you so much, Kelsey. We are happy that you're well enough to join us in worship and share the, the message. At this time, friends, uh, let us share any joys or concerns that we may have with one another. I took it out from here. So um, I'm here again today in place of Dawn, she, who is feeling great. She wants everybody to know she feels fine, but she tested positive last night again for COVID. So she's not with us today, but she will be back next week. And I just, maybe you're, somebody's gonna say something later, but I wanna share a joy as we were singing with gusto that we have the Knowles with us here today and hit uh, Reverend Knowles, Bill Knowles. I couldn't hear you, Fran, but I could hear Bill. So we're really, really glad to have our former pastors here with us today. Thank you. So uh, continued prayers for Don and the kids well as Corey, and thank you, um, the Knowles, for joining us in worship. Please remember um, Pat and her family in your time of prayer. I have received the word that Pat's um, sister, Becky, um, is facing her probably her last few days. So remember um, her as um, this transition is taking in their lives. Yes. A uh, prayer of concern for Lisa Gill. Uh, Lisa was one of Dina's best friends in college, 
and a mother of two. Uh, she and her husband, Dave, were married probably about as long as Dina and I have been married. And uh, Lisa passed away on Friday from a battle with breast cancer. So please keep Dina and all her Wells sisters in your prayers as they deal with this loss, as well as Dave and her children. So prayers of peace and comfort for all those who are grieving at this time. I do have a joy to share. Um, we received the word from Yuli that she gave birth to a baby girl last Sunday. Um, her name is Madeline, and they're all doing fine. So congratulations to Yuli is our preschool director, and she had a baby. So please remember um, the, the family as she recovers and as they get adjusted to their new baby. Any other joys or concerns that we need to share with one another? Let us prepare our hearts for prayer by singing together. pray together in silence first. Our leading and guiding God, you have opened the doors to us for true service and love. We're encouraged to become involved in ministries of peace and justice. For the light of promise is reflected in your spirit, which rests in each one of us. So God, as we come to this worship service and hear your message, help us to get ready to serve you at all times. Continue to guide our lives as we learn more of what you would have us to do. But merciful God, you know us all too well. For change and challenges are usually difficult for us to handle. We're more inclined to turn our backs on opportunities of service than step in to affect the needed changes that will promote healing and wholeness. So Lord, forgive us. Forgive us when we give lip service to you and then slip into inaction. But God, through the witness of Jesus, we know that you are constantly calling each of us to the task. The promise of hope and justice is given to this world and we have to become bearers of that promise. And now is a time for work and witness. And now is a time for hope and peace. Now is a time for each one of us to do our part in establishing your kingdom. So Lord, once again, get us ready for service. Pick us up, dust us off, and put us on the pathways of justice at all times. O oh Lord, at this time, we bring many different prayers before you. There are different things happening in our world, our community, our state, we remember those who are suffering due to wildfires, wind damages, COVID, as well as different situations happening due to finances. Lord, we are scared and anxious as to what's going to happen to this world. But Lord, as we come before you, we know that you are in control and that you will reign. And Lord, help us to be part of your good work instead of sitting by the sidelines and waiting for someone else to do the work. Allow us to fully use all the gifts that you have given us 
so that we can help build a better place in this world. We thank you, O oh God, for being with us. We thank you for all the people who are present with us as we worship together. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught his friends to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 1 to 31a. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we are all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am, a, because I am, a, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again to the head, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need to, of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the God body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members would, may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed the, in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? 
Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts. The word of the Lord. So I hear uh, today is a big day, the Rams versus the Bucks. <laughs> um, as you have probably figured out by now, I'm not much of a preacher that uses a lot of sports illustration or talk about sports on a weekly basis. But today is your lucky day if you're a sports fan. <laughs> Let us pray first. Oh Lord, as we come to this time of worship, we open our hearts to your words. May it be your words spoken to our hearts. May it take root and may it grow so that it may bear fruit through our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the time Bob arrived at the football game, the first quarter was almost over. Why are you so late, his friend asked. Oh, I had to flip a coin to decide between going to church and coming to the game. Bob answered. How long could, they have take, could that have taken you? Asked his friend. Well, said Bob, I had to flip it 12 times. <laughs> For football fans, I believe we just got done with the college national championship game and now nearing the Super Bowl. Since football season is almost over, I'm sure none of our members had to flip a coin about whether to attend church or watch a game today, maybe later after the church. We can be thankful for that. And one thing I have learned is that sports writers generally have a great sense of humor. When Gatorade inventor Robert K. died at the age of 80, one commentator wrote, his remains will be cremated and then the ashes dumped over some football coach's head. <laughs> After the New Year's Day bowl games, many wives would have probably agreed with the late great Irma Bombeck who said, if a man watches three football games in a row, he should be declared legally dead. <laughs> of course, I do know that many women are also rabid football fans. Prolific author Leonard Sweet tells about a college football game that turned out to be a terrible mismatch. One team outweighed the other by 30 pounds per man, was more experienced, better coached, etc. The lighter, weaker team was being terribly beaten, not only on the scoreboard, but also on their bodies. They were bruised and cut and bleeding, and several first stringers had left the game already. As they gathered around in their huddle late in the final period, the quarterback noticed that they had 12 men on the field, one more than the 11 allowed by the rules. If the referee discovered the extra man on the field, he would assess a penalty, thereby adding to their already deep humiliation. Look, the quarterback said to his teammates, we'll try a quick running play that will take us past the bench. As we pass the bench, I want one of you to drop out. If we can do this fast enough, the referee may not notice and we can avoid a penalty. <laughs> Amidst a great confusion, they succeeded in running the play right past their bench. When they returned to the huddle to decide on their next play, the quarterback discovered to his amazement that six men had dropped out. Those football players were discouraged, or maybe they were amazingly wise. After all, they were severely overmatched, so they absented themselves from the game. And unfortunately, that sometimes happens in church. People get discouraged and they drop out, or they simply get lazy and drop out. 
Or perhaps they get upset with the pastor and drop out. Whatever the reason, whenever anyone from our fellowship drops out, all of us hurt in our ability to be all God means for us to be. Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand and it do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Well-known retired seminary professor Fred Craddock once pointed out that the church was not born full grown. It needed to grow in its self-understanding. What was the church? How should its life be shaped? As Craddock point, pointed out, there was no shortage of models from which these early Christians could draw. For example, they could have patterned their church life after the temple. They loved the temple. It was the place of worship but they did not pattern themselves after the temple because the temple was exclusive. It was clergy dominated. Or they could have patterned themselves after the synagogue. Synagogues were led by the laity. There were informal places where people gathered to read, hear, and discuss the scriptures. But they did not model their corporate life after the synagogue. Or the church could have remained as simply an informal movement with no formal organization, just the power of the preacher and his or her message. Craddock noted that such movements have revitalized the church through the ages. But movements come and go. The early church needed to be something more than a movement. There were other possibilities for the church to pattern itself after, but each had its limitations. Ultimately, Craddock concluded, the church came to understand itself as the body of Christ. And that is the way Apostle Paul thought of the church, a body, a unified whole with many parts dependent on each other. As someone else has noted throughout the Bible, there are other word pictures about what the church should be. In 1 Corinthians 3, the church is compared to a field and to a building. In Ephesians 5, the church is compared to a bride. In each of these comparisons, the church is like this or like that. But in today's passage, Paul says, the church is the body of Christ. Not like the body of Christ, but we are the body of Christ. And we can't afford to take any part of the body for granted. Pastor and author Kenneth Chafin tells of a very gifted athlete he knew in college whose athletic career ended when he seriously injured his big toe in an accident. If you are an athlete who has severely injured your toe, you know how debilitating that it can be. And so it is with the church. We are the body of Christ, and that means each of us has a vital role to play. And just as a body needs its eyes and its ears and its stomach and, yes, its big toe, so the church needs all its different parts 
to be what God has called us to be. You may remember years ago um, when Snoopy, the lovable beagle in the Peanuts cartoon, had his broken left leg. So hundreds of people wrote letters to Snoopy or sent to sympathy cards. Snoopy himself philosophized about his plight one day while perched on top of his doghouse and looking at the huge white cast on his leg. My body blames my foot for not being able to go places, he says. My foot says it was my head's fault, and my head blames my eyes. My eyes say my feet are clumsy, and my right foot says not to blame him for what my left foot did. Snoopy looks out at his audience and confesses, I don't say anything because I don't want to get involved. <laughs> you know, there are many people who don't want to get involved. They want only a nominal relationship with the church. Spiritually, however, that's not possible for you to be healthy. Casual attendance at worship is not enough for you to be spiritually well. Your church also needs your service. We have a community that we need to cultivate, or should I say a world to cultivate, and we need your involvement. Again, Paul writes, the eyes cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concerns for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. The fact that you are a member of the church means that your gifts are needed, your abilities, your talents. And it's not enough to simply occupy a pew each week. Reverend Bob Record gives us another powerful analogy. He notes that in March of 1981, President Ronald Reagan was shot by John Hinckley Jr. and was hospitalized for several weeks. Although Reagan was the nation's chief executive, his hospitalization had little impact on the nation's activity. Government continued on. On the other hand, suppose the garbage collectors in this country went on strike, as they did sometime back in Philadelphia. That city was not only in a literal mess, the pile of decaying trash quickly became a health hazard. And suppose that happened throughout our land. A three-week nationwide strike would paralyze our country. So who is more important, asked Bob Eckert. The president or the garbage collectors? And in the kingdom of God, all of us, again, are equally important. If any of us fail to do our part, the church is poorer for it. Another pastor uses the analogy of a space shuttle. Space shuttles were used on a total of 135 missions from 1981 to 2011. And sadly, we remember that two shuttles exploded shortly after launching, killing 14 astronauts. How did that happen? 
And we are told that a space shuttle has well over a million working parts. And each one of those parts has to function practically flawlessly for a successful takeoff and landing. I'm pretty sure some of you already know this because you are directly involved in that. And if a part the size of a card in a plane deck is missing and not working, you have a potential disaster on your hands. And on the human side of things, there are literally thousands of tech specialists, maintenance workers, and engineers involved in each mission. And all of these diverse parts, human and otherwise, have to work together seamlessly, everyone contributing their own particular expertise in order to ensure the safety of each astronaut aboard those billion-dollar high-tech machines. And someone has wisely noted that it shouldn't really be a surprise when a shuttle explodes during a launch or implodes on re-entry. Rather, it's absolutely miraculous when all of the parts work together for a safe, uneventful, and successful mission. All that you and I see is a flawless, seemingly easy launch and landing with no big deal. But that's wrong. The process is so complex with many different special people and diverse mechanical parts coming together to make it look easy. And friends, church is just like that. We have people serving in diverse roles. Sunday school teachers, greeters, members of the outreach team, etc. And as God has gifted each of us, all those parts are important for the ministry of Christ's kingdom. Each of us is essential to the task of working with God to bring in God's kingdom. So remember, you are important regardless of the role you play. General Dwight Eisenhower once rebuked one of, one of his generals for referring to a soldier as just a private. He reminded him that the army could function better without its generals than it could without its foot soldiers. If the war is won, he said, it will be won by the privates. And that's true of any army, especially that army which is the Church of Jesus Christ. Each of you is precious to the group of people, and we need each of you to offer your talents to making this church all that God meant for it to be. Philosopher Soren Kierkegaard once told a parable of a community of ducks. Each Sunday, these ducks would rattle off to duck church to hear the duck preacher. The duck preacher would speak eloquently and passionately about how God has given the ducks a special gift. The gift was wings with which to fly. With these wings, the duck preacher could assure them there is nowhere ducks cannot go. With those wings, there is no God-given task the ducks cannot accomplish. With those wings, they can soar into the very presence of God. And as the duck preacher exhorted his duck congregation, shouts of amen were quacked throughout the congregation. Wings were lifted in praise. And then, at the conclusion of the service, the ducks left the gathering place, commenting on what a wonderful message they had heard. And each of the ducks quietly rattled their way back home. They did not use their gifts at all. That happens sometimes, and 
What a tragedy that would be if that is as far as our discipleship, God. Mother Teresa put it this way. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all, blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Friends, you are Christ's body. You are the hope of this world. And it's time for us to lift up our wings and fly. Amen. Our offering today is about responding to God's love and grace with the gifts of our own lives. Today, we invite you to respond to God's love with your whole heart, your life, and your gifts. We won't be passing a plate through the aisles, but if you'd like to make a gift today, you can use the QR code found in the back of the pew to link to our online giving, or you can drop an offering of a check or cash in the box in the lobby. Thank you. I won't be singing the duet that is listed today with Dawn. <laughs> Hopefully that will be next week. I will be singing In the Morning, a spiritual which was arranged by the great 20th century American composer, Charles Ives.
please join me in the prayer of dedication. Holy word, holy breath, holy maker of all, with gratitude for making us one body, we share our gifts with one another and with the world. Amen. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>